This video is sponsored by Ren. Let's look at this artwork. Here is the description of the artist on the dealer's website. All right, so did that help you appreciate her more? Here is a quote by the artist. So she isn't focused on describing something you can see. She wants to describe something you can feel. If I started by saying, what feeling would you say this painting describes? You might actually look at it a number a second time. So why does the gallery make it so incomprehensible? Why are they so focused on being pretentious? Well, it's because the art world benefits off of being something that's basically a luxury brand. They don't want the masses to get it because that decreases the sort of value of it. That decreases the sense that it is special and different. They don't want people to think they can get it, nor do they actually want people to think they could do it. Abstract art is constantly being accused of something my kid could do. And that's also why they're very closely tied to the university and MFA system. You have to have special degrees to make art that matters enough to be in galleries. In other words, they are creating a system that excludes, purposefully excludes people. So what do we do about that? Well, one thing I do about that is I tell you about these works of art. You don't have to like it, but even hearing it in a way that is different than the way that a lot of museums communicate about art is setting up a new paradigm for understanding abstract art. While it remains a burden assiduously avoided, it is not unexpected and thus not beyond a measure of control, which has led you inexorably here. You haven't answered my question. Academic language, complicated concepts, and big words are elitist, at least as they are most commonly used. But they can also be really important and good. The biggest problem, in my opinion, is where the language gets placed and why. We'll talk about that as we go on. I want to start by talking about this TikTok by this TikToker named The Only Other Dan. He actually has a follow-up that's pretty good too, where he talks about this concept. We've got to minimize the, the use of academic language around this. So again, I'm, I'm calling myself out here. I'm calling myself out here because I've done it as much. And it has been an absolutely an ego trip because I like learning and I do like learning stuff. And then I like sharing it. But I realize in terms of progression, in terms of change, in terms of actually getting in touch with the general populace and the general public to make things happen, that is counterproductive. This is only true amongst other academics. This is not true amongst the general populace and, and people in the comments of that video openly make that clear. And actually there's even misunderstandings within the comments that demonstrate how untrue this is. It's not that I was unaware of the things the only other Dan was talking about, but seeing that recalibrated the way I was gonna go about the conversation because it reminded me that there is a practical reality to the conversations that are at play that differs from person to person. And that should be something that's intuitive to me, but you know, yeah, I've been busy, I've been tired, so. <laughs> the reality is that a lot of the times academic language is elitist. Now, I think that there's an ongoing trend, especially on social media, where you see young people more and more resistant to using academic language or just more and more resistant to like big words, talking about big words, this and this. And it's really simple and easy to laugh at kids, laugh at young people nowadays for being like lacking in literacy. Trust me, I could do a whole other video talking about that and talking about issues with literacy in this day and age. But I think that there is a, a, a deeper issue that has to be addressed in terms of why people use big words. Wait, 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 wait a second now, past Elliot. Hey, it's me, Elliot from the future. I'm in a black sweater. And I've got a lot of things that I need to add because I've been doing my research and my reading since you recorded. And the first of those things is that this video is sponsored by Ren. So the climate crisis is bad. It's really bad. And I think we all kind of know that. And we all are feeling that sense of impending doom, you know, fun stuff. Of course, many of us try to do different things in our own lives, small things here and there. I try to buy things secondhand in terms of clothing, especially, and I try to minimize the amount of times I use a car, but it, it can often feel like for one, it's not doing too much, and for two, that there's some other stuff that we can be doing, but we're not quite sure what. And that's where Ren offers some potential solutions. Ren offers a simple and effective service that can help us make a difference in the climate crisis. It involves supporting actual collective efforts to protect marginalized people and to protect our Earth. 
Ren has this website where you can actually calculate your carbon footprint, and then you can offset it by helping to fund a number of different carbon reduction projects. All you have to do is answer a few different questions about your lifestyle, you get this approximate calculation, and then when you choose what project you wanna support, you get monthly updates from them, showing you photos and details on trees planted, acres reforested. A particular example that I was interested in is the Clean Cooking Fuel for Refugees project. This project transforms waste from farm into charcoal briquettes, creating clean energy in the process. The briquettes are used to help displaced persons in the Ajimani settlements of northern Uganda. When I do these videos, I try not only to uplift people from feeling doom and gloom all the time because I want people to feel better and to understand more about the world around them, but also because it's, it's not beneficial. And we can actually spend time doing research, donating, and working in collectives to try to make the world around us better to whatever degree possible. And so perhaps Ren can offer you a way to do that yourself. If so, I have a deal for you. The first 100 people who sign up using the link in the description will have 10 extra trees planted in their name. Cool, right? So maybe you might want to get on that? I don't know, it's up to you. Thanks to Ren for sponsoring. Let's get back to the video. Now, I'm using the word elitist a lot. Let's get a, a proper definition that we can agree on. So Oxford offers two. First, it says elitism is the advocacy or existence of an elite as a dominating element in a system or society. And then it also says the attitude or behavior of a person or group who regard themselves as belonging to an elite. And I think that the second one is a little bit more what people mean when they say elitist, right? When we talk about somebody being elitist, we usually equate that with snobbery. This person is a snob, this person thinks that they're better than other people, that they're part of some elite and that only people on that level can meet with them. It's an arrogance, right? But there's a deeper idea at play, which is that it's, it's rooted in a social view or an implied social view that the elite are the best, that they're the elite for a reason and that they should be given control over important things which ultimately a lot of the uses of academic language and big words reifies. Because a lot of the times, first of all, when we use big words and when we try to sound smart, as people like to say, the way that we do it is in a way that we're trying to impose a sense of superiority on the people that are listening to us. Like, yeah, I'm smart. Look at the way that I complicatedly said this cool sentence really fast, like a scene from Sherlock. And what that means is that we're equating superiority with a particular type of intellectualism. Not an intellect that's like street smart, it's not an intellect that's like I'm emotionally intelligent or whatever, or I'm smart about how to use people's times or how to be wise or all that. It's I know big words. I know sophisticated concepts that can only be acquired through hard study that is used by time that you would only have if you're privileged and in institutions usually that you would only get to if you're privileged. So you're, 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 you're basically saying like, yeah, I'm better than you because of this, right? It's a, it's a type of bragging that we all do. Sometimes we want to sound smart. And, and that's not necessarily even the worst thing, but it's really problematic in how prevalent it is and how much it takes over how we talk about politics. Now, to illustrate why I think this language is actually useful ultimately and where I think the divide is, I'm going to use a metaphor, okay? I'm going to talk about gaming. You guys are cool gamer nerds, right? Yeah. In gaming, of course, you have the toxicity of like get good and all that. But there's a there's a deeper thing at play there, right? There's expert level players in a video game and any video game at this point. And there's also mostly casuals, right? Beginners. And there's a sort of divide about who games get tailored to and whether or not expert level players are elitist or da da da. But what we really understand by that is that there's different roles in everything. There's some people who want to get really into something and become an expert in it. And then there's some people who just want to partake in it casually for fun or for casual learning. So to say like never use academic language or never use big words is kind of like saying there should never be expert gaming. There should never be high level competitive esports. You wouldn't say that, right? Because you recognize that that doesn't have anything really to do with your enjoyment of the game, not directly. So there should be spaces for each. There should be a space for each that do not have to crash into each other. And expertise is good ultimately, right? Or at least it is a thing that has a lot of benefits. People who are experts at something should have their space to be experts at something. They should have their space to, to nerd out with each other, to communicate with each other, to build community. And a lot of the time, those experts are the people who are in the best position to help out the beginners and the casuals. So as an example, when we're talking about like Tekken, JDCR, he's one of the best Tekken players in the world. And he also has a YouTube channel where sometimes he'll upload videos talking to fans about 
Tekken about how he plays and about how they can play, how they can get better, or just different things that people at different levels might be interested in when it comes to the game. Thus, that's an example of an expert benefiting the beginners. Now, in terms of gaming, it's a, it's a simpler and clearer divide, right? I think so. But where do things get more complicated? Where does the metaphor kind of fall apart when it comes to academic language and things like that? Let's do an ad and then I'll talk to you about it. So the reason that I was interested in this topic and talking about it was today I went on Reddit and I went on the r slash Buddhism subreddit because I'm really into Buddhism and I noticed that there are some posts that people shared from a blog called Speculative Non-Buddhism and that blog from what I can tell is a blog that sort of uses post-structuralist and post-modernist frames of discourse and conceptuality to talk about issues with modern day Buddhism or issues with Buddhism and, and all these different practices and interrogating certain certain ideas, etc, etc. And there's a sort of combative nature that it has with the material that in a way reads as like people who are skeptical of Buddhism, people who are, you know, fighting against Buddhists. And so people on the Buddhism subreddit aren't necessarily super receptive to those blog posts. At least they weren't in the years that those are posted and I don't think people post from there anymore. Especially because some of the posters are in this like high ivory tower sense of like, I'm gonna tell you people how you should think about Buddhism. What a lot of folks said though in response, it's probably something that you found yourself saying as well and part of why this conversation is pertaining to you is the idea of like ELI5, like what does this mean? Why is this person speaking in this really complicated way? I don't understand what this means. And a lot of people were even saying additionally, and this is relevant to me because I got a comment that said something fairly similar recently, that if you can't explain something in simple terms, then you don't really know it very well. Now, I have some issues with that idea because I think some concepts are just too complicated to break down in simple terms, right? And if we're talking about certain complicated concepts, even if you can break them down in simple terms, the value of them is partially in how rich and nuanced they are and how rich and nuanced the conversation becomes. So you wouldn't necessarily expect a neuroscientist to explain neuroscience to you in a minute. And if they were unable to do so, you would be like, you don't understand neuroscience, accomplished neuroscientists. Like, no, you would understand that there's a lot of things that they would have to leave out and oversimplify. And so even what they're able to relate to you is going to be a very partial, very simplified, narrow thing and not at all the entirety of what they do. So I don't think that that's necessarily true, but I think that there's a value there. And I think that more importantly, that demand for simplification or a simpler way of discussing these concepts reveals something to us about why big words are elitist. It reveals to us that the problem is where these things are put. r slash Buddhism is a subreddit where Buddhists or people who are interested in Buddhism converge to talk about Buddhism. And a lot of the times the conversations are base level conversations, beginners conversations, or just casual, you know, contemplative conversations that people who are just interested in the topics will sit down and talk to each other about. Not a lot of it is heady. Like they don't want to get heady generally on there because people are aren't like that's not the demographic you know what I mean so for people to post that extremely heady complicated content on there of course everybody is going to be combative towards it especially when it seems like something that is combative towards that audience and so this is where a lot of the problem comes from is that people are like getting these big words and these complicated concepts in spaces where they're not really supposed to you're not supposed to start learning about why things are bad politically through complicated wordy social media posts on Twitter or video essays, right? I mean, some video essays do a great job of simplifying things, but a lot of them are complicated and dense and you're not supposed to be reading that. <laughs> you're not supposed to be intaking that. And so intended audience is extremely important. When you are using certain words, when you are describing things, who are you talking to? And why are you talking to them in this way? Do you really think that they're going to understand what you're saying? Or are you saying it so that you can impress upon them that they won't understand? Are you saying it so that you can reveal, so that you can perform, that you know more than the receptor, that you know more than the person you're talking to? Now, that's Buddhism and spirituality. And I think when it comes to concepts of politics and social issues and economics, it becomes even more complicated because it's one thing if it's a spiritual doctrine or it's definitely a completely different thing if it's gaming. It's one thing to be like, I don't wanna engage with expert level discourse on gaming. I just wanna engage with the most beginner basic stuff. When it comes to Tekken 7, I just wanna learn which character is the most fun to play with. But when you're talking about the way that the world works, 
and climate change and racism. Like you're not supposed to just settle for the most basic beginner thing. And I do think that that's one thing that I, I really try to impress upon people is that if you're always looking for the most basic simplified version of something, the most simplified explanation of something, you're not really gonna understand most of what you're learning. You're really gonna get very simple ideas that often are extremely contradictory and have to be expounded upon way, way more. And so to think that that is in itself learning about the concept in particular is naive. And in fact, it's really dangerous when you see this approach that people have like i ain't reading all that or I, this is too complicated i'm never going to engage with this this is too complicated da, da, da. like you can engage with it if you reach that level and there's something to be said about the importance of doing your reading doing your studying and getting better and better at understanding complicated ideas so when it comes to those important issues how much expertise should we have how much should we try to know here's the thing right you have to sometimes dig and you had to sometimes accept that like you got to read extra hard and and the fact that you don't have the space and the time to do the extra studying to really understand the concepts and the, and the world around you is not really your fault it's the fault of the exploitation that's going on in your life and the issues that you got in your life but that doesn't mean that every time you see something that's complicated or every time you see a big word that it's terrible and you you can you can just shame that like no that stuff is there for a reason and it's very helpful actually so this is a passage from Capital Volume 1 by Karl Marx. This is abridged by Jenny Dusen for Emery. This is a complicated passage. A commodity is therefore a mysterious thing simply because in it the social character of men's labor appears to them as an objective character stamped upon the product of that labor. Because the relation of the producers to the sum total of their own labor is presented to them as a social relation, existing not between themselves but between the products of their labor. This is the reason why the products of labor become commodities, social things whose qualities are at the same time perceptible and imperceptible by the senses. In the same way the life of an object is perceived by us not as a subjective excitation of our optic nerve, but as the objective form of something outside the eye itself. But in the act of seeing, there is a physical relation between physical things, but it is different with commodities. Maybe the existence of a thing called commodity and the evaluation between the products of labor which stands for the commodity have absolutely no connection with the physical property and the material relations deriving therefrom. Then the definition of relation between men and seeing the eye have to form a relation between things. Look at how the relation between the products of labor which stands for the commodity. How does the definition of separate relation between commodities? So as an example of how this works, I'll explain to you what that passage means as simple as I can after the ad break. Okay, so, you know, as I understand it, this long passage, which is abridged, by the way, is discussing a concept called commodity fetishism that Marx has, which you can agree with or not agree with. I don't know what your political doctrine is. But in it, essentially what he's saying is that commodities are treated as and are viewed as their own entities, that they are separated entirely from the human work and the human assignment of ideas onto them. And instead, to us, they are almost like living, breathing things. They are almost like fetishes in the, in the old religious sense, right? Like these things that we think have all this inherent value, but when we actually think about it, we realize oh, it, it's not really inherently that value. We're assigning that value onto it. We're giving it that value. We're giving it meaning. In other words, it's the idea that a commodity is like a living being, is like a living concept, is like a material resource that is extremely necessary, which in fact is not really true. It's something we give meaning to. Okay, so that's a simplified version of that, except there's all these concepts that I can't really explain to you, I, I, just telling you like that, right? <laughs> like it doesn't, I, like what I explained to you is like kind of it, but it's not 100% that. And only in like reading this over and over again are you able to see like, oh, well, Elliot left out that like it is the social character of men's labor that appears to them as an objective character. So it's talking about human labor is being concentrated in a specific way so as to be rendered invisible to the naked eye because exploitation is so like there's all these different things you could pull from it but you wouldn't be able to if you're just like oh what's the t what's the tldr what's the simplified version oh yeah it's just commodities are, are real things like that's not it so with that said at the same time complication is an endless pit you can contemplate and contemplate over and over again and there's a value to that and there's a value to the the communities of people oftentimes it's their work who study and write and write these extremely dense pieces of work and then talk to each other about it. There's a value in that, right? But that value doesn't reveal itself 
in the everyday sense. And more importantly, there's nothing really superior about that. There's nothing superior about knowing really big ideas and concepts because there is no end to it. It's constantly shifting. One person can say, this is a thing. You know, power dynamics is a thing. Foucault can say power dynamics exist in all these different exchanges and all of our, but then somebody can look at Foucault and be like, okay, but what about the differentiation and the levels of the power dynamics? And then somebody can go to that and we'll be like, what about the levels of power dynamics are only perceived? Like everybody can just make things more and more complicated. It's the same concept as the kid that's like, why this, why this? And you're just like, because this is this. And the more that they ask why, the more you realize like, wait a minute, like, this is annoying. <laughs> like you could just keep asking why forever. And eventually it's just like, I don't know. It's cause it is right. It just, it just is. And yeah, there's a value in theorizing and contemplating. There's a value in being Freud, but then there's also a value in being a psychologist, a practicing psychologist, a therapist. And we need way more therapists and practicing psychologists than we need Freud's. If everybody tried to be Freud, that would be really annoying. And nobody would get the basic needs that they get from psychologists. And this is where the biggest problem is when it comes to big words. In our social media age of political discourse and social discourse, we are seeing a deficit in the understanding of these roles and the need for these roles and the lack of superiority in terms of these roles. Or at least we're seeing a misalignment, a misattribution of superiority to the people who are theorizing who know things and who say big words. When in reality, isn't it actually more important one can argue, the basic simple stuff that applies to everybody. Is Buddhism great because of these extremely complex abstract concepts that are revealed in obscure speeches that the Buddha gave that aren't even part of the main canon? Is Tekken great because of the extremely complicated moves somebody like JDCR can pull off in a competition? Or are these things great because they are popular, because they catch on with many people, because anybody can take it and, and just have their own casual, unique experience with it. And that ultimately there is a base service and a base good that you can get from it, which doesn't require getting super deep into super deep concepts. Okay, Elliot from the past, it's me again. Hi, I know. I'm tired of me too. So in the time since recording that original take, I wanted to take more time to, to learn about the subject matter because I wasn't 100% comfortable with the original product, so to speak. And I did some reading and I wanted to share some things with you guys that I thought was really interesting and really brings home a, a point that I was unable to find at first. So I first found this article from the Anarchist Library entitled Elitist Language, which kind of feels like a counter argument to this video. It's written by a writer named Peter Gelderloos, who acknowledges that there can be inaccessibility and gaps in communication when it comes to this language, but also cautions against merely conceding academic language as inherently inaccessible, noting that it's needed in order to address complex issues. How can we explain complex, obscure ideas in a simple language, which is already heavily controlled by the culture industry, conveyed in brief and easily digestible segments sensitive to the general public's decreasing attention spans? I think the obvious answer is that we can't. We need to recognize that language in our society is used as a tool of control and the trend towards smaller vocabularies, simpler syntax, and shorter attention spans is one of the most effective forms of disempowerment ever devised. Resisting the dumbing down of language and developing our ability to think critically is as important a long-term goal as winning community autonomy and economic self-sufficiency. Woo. So there's obviously a lot of analysis that I'm not going to be able to get into. And there's a lot to say about, well, is academic language not part of those things that it's potentially, according to Peter, more important than meaning community autonomy and economic self-sufficiency? And also, is he being a little bit too degrading or too dismissive of what potentially simple language and simple ideas can offer? I don't know, um, that would be something to talk about in a different video. But for the purposes of this video, I do think that he articulates a point that is important and that we can at least all acknowledge, which is that it's, it's important to make people more educated, to raise people's consciousness, you know, to help people think more critically. And learning complex ideas and words has to be part of that, to some degree at least. The part that stands out to me the most is where Gelderloos says our duty as middle class activists is to use our education to make complex language accessible rather than passing off everything not immediately accessed with ease by the majority as inherently inaccessible. And that's where that divide is, right? I think the idea is 
Academic language isn't inherently elitist. It isn't inherently inaccessible. As I said at the beginning of the video, the way that it's deployed ends up that way through the structures currently in place. And not only do we have to do a better job as a middle class of reaching out to people across class and identity boundaries to teach each other what we know and try to raise our consciousness, but we also have to realize that these languages, these ideas have been co-opted by elites, by powerful people to address their concerns and not the concerns of the lower classes and the more marginalized, so to speak. So there's a Georgetown professor and writer who I think we'll be talking about a lot more in future videos named Olufemi Taiwo, and he uses the term elite capture to describe this phenomenon. He writes, the concept of elite capture originated in the study of developing countries to describe the way socially advantaged people tend to gain control over financial benefits meant for everyone, especially foreign aid. But the concept has also been applied more generally to describe how political projects can be hijacked in principle or in effect by the well-positioned and resourced. The idea also helps to explain how public resources such as knowledge, attention, and values get distorted and distributed by our power structures. So something that can originate as a source for all classes to help themselves, to, to empower themselves, eventually becomes something for the elites. Due to the elites' ability to get the first dibs on and control the production of and the dissemination of any resource. Taiwo has a book that he's published recently that is named after the term, wherein he labels elite capture the increasing domination of elite interests and control over aspects of our social system, and says almost everything in our social world has a tendency to fall prey to elite capture. <laughs> so ultimately, maybe it's not even best to say academic language is elitist, even if we are understanding that to mean in deployment and not in inherent nature. The more important point is to point out that it is the elites and it is the people in power that take these things and make them elitist. Much in the same way elites would take, you know, foreign aid in struggling countries and use it for their own purposes. We shouldn't just give up on big words and concede them to the upper classes, concede them to people in power just because we assume that working class people won't get it. That actually in itself is an elitist tendency. Working class people are not dumber than academics. What they're lacking is the time and the resources and whatever fortune it would take to get in the position that the academic has to be able to read the books and da da da. And that's where we owe it to the people who have less resources than us, whether we're academics or whether we're people who just read stuff for fun, we owe it to the folks that are less resourced than us to share what we have. Paolo Frieri writes in one of the best books ever written about a factory worker that was involved in this group discussion, one of the many group discussions that they would have when learning and growing and developing conscientiousness in different parts of the population in Brazil. According to Frieri, the factory worker says, perhaps I am the only one here of working class origin. I can't say that I've understood everything you've said just now, but I can say one thing. When I began this course, I was naive. And when I found out how naive I was, I started to get critical. But this discovery hasn't made me a fanatic and I don't feel any collapse either. We don't have to sit here and assume that people who are not exposed to these things on a regular basis simply would have their world collapse or simply would, would only move to the worst tendencies if they were suddenly exposed to new language and complex ideas that was critical of the world around them. When I see the only other dance TikToks and TikToks like that, I think that they're talking about this elite capture of academic language. Because ultimately, the big words become meaningless when they're not attached to material change. You see it all the time. You see people who will go on network television, who will get these big platforms and publish these big books talking about you know, defeating racism or understanding these different aspects of systemic racism, da da da, but don't propose or discuss any type of material reality that's behind that, any type of political economy behind that. All they're doing is pointing out certain lived experiences and cultural experiences with these new sophisticated words and this beautiful language, and yeah, there's a place for that. But when they do that, and then there's no other people actually explaining how the world works economically and politically to cause cause that. What you end up with is people like Hillary Clinton asking, how, how do banks have anything to do with racism, right? This is an insight that Olufemi Taiwo was talking about in a podcast called What's Left of Philosophy. Like, we, we assume now that 
racism is just this racism thing. And the way to defeat racism is to empower certain voices, empower marginalized voices from these communities, which is to say, find the rich and well-educated people from these communities and give them book deals or give them leading roles in television shows. And it's like, that doesn't do anything for the people in the neighborhood who are struggling, who are working 24 hours. And on top of that, when that's all that we see and when that's what the elites have done to our ability to process social justice and things like that, then that becomes what we emit when, when it comes to this language, when it comes to these ideas. And especially we do that through social media, wherein sometimes we have even the right intentions in mind, although sometimes we don't, sometimes we're just cloud chasing, but it ends up becoming this, this performative wokeness, right? This performativity of having the right politics rather than doing anything for anyone. Charlie of the blog Evil Female writes, In the aesthetic of smarm, nothing matters more than the circularity of discourse. Every political or personal argument is dissected for not accounting for every possible nuance or bad faith reading. These are the things that we're familiar with now when it comes to academic language. It's not some understanding of how the workers in the local factory or the nurses in the local hospital are stripped of their time and their effort and their labor and their money and put under harsh conditions while capitalists make money off of them. We associate instead this language with motherfuckers on Twitter. And again, that term of elite capture, I think, summates really what I was trying to articulate, and I'm really glad that I was able to find it even after the original recording. One of the best examples of it comes from one of the Taiwo articles for The Philosopher, where he writes about the Michigan's Department of Environmental Quality in the Flint water crisis and how it was established using language like healthy communities and putting people at the forefront that were black, much like the people in Flint ultimately to take a stance that the Flint water crisis was no longer a thing, the water was fine, people were better now thanks to liberalism, thanks to Obama and da da da. And the people of Flint were not taking that lying down. They worked tirelessly, they worked with local scientists to prove evidence of how bad the water still was. They worked with media publications to publicize their efforts. They took on the epistemological forefront of the argument. They took it away from those people that were originally in power from that department in terms of centering themselves with the facts and with their efforts. As Taiwo writes, they didn't need their oppression to be celebrated, centered, or narrated in the newest academic parlance. They didn't need someone to understand what it felt like to be poisoned. What they needed was the lead out of their water. So they got to work. Okay, let's go to an ad break and then conclude with old Elliot in his big sweater. See you there. So yeah, um, if you're in a situation where you're learning about concepts, if you're new to stuff, try to find your way through learning bit by bit. Find the beginner stuff, but then also recognize that the beginner stuff is not gonna be enough and use it as a way to learn this. And you're gonna recognize that you're gonna make a lot of mistakes, but you can only learn through making mistakes, through making errors, through being ignorant about certain things. And anytime you feel inadequate when it comes to learning things about the world around you, remember that what you're ultimately doing is something that's noble and that's gonna help you and the people around you and that there's nothing wrong with messing up. Messing up is part of it. Messing up is good. And if you're a person who, like me, loves to dig into nerdy stuff and get into academic concepts, then just recognize that there's a space for that and recognize that sometimes we do that out of a sense of ego, that we're trying to sound smarter than people, but that's not always good. In fact, that's usually not a good thing, maybe never a good thing. So be wary of that and be wary of when you're actually interested in just learning and just gaining expertise or just, just digging through a concept as much as possible because it's fun and interesting to you. And if you're interested in digging into concepts and having fun and talking and just you know being free and, and, and flowing like the wind, and if you're interested in, in talking, uh, in general. Well, sorry, uh, this is my channel. I talk on it. But if you like hearing me talk, then you should watch some other of my videos. Uh, I have a video about burnout and you can watch that one. It's pretty good. I like it. And also uh, hit like and subscribe and comment and do other stuff. Yeah, I'm sweaty. It's, it's hot in here. I got to take this sweater off. So see you. Have a good one.